Good morning. Thanks to uh, Lexington for having us this morning. Glad to see you all come out. This is a great crowd. And thanks to Lex Arts for uh, hosting Mark's exhibition. Um, when you think about this theme of moments, uh, moments that made you who you are, I think uh, Mark's work is extremely uh, relative to that. Uh, I'd encourage you to go buy a catalog or go online to the Kentucky Folk Arts Center and read about Mark's biography. But I remember the first moment when I saw Mark's work, to give a little context to this, it was 2003. It was the, I had just come to the Kentucky Folk Arts Center and we installed a show of prison art from around the state. And um, Mark had, had a couple pieces in it and they really stood out amongst the bowls made of playing cards and the matchstick fiddles and the popsicle stick sculptures. Mark was doing something different, even if it was more rudimentary back then. And we knew we needed to keep an eye on him. And uh, we did, and he went on to become, I think, make the best prison art that's ever been made in the history of the world. And it's, it's truly extraordinary work. The show that you saw out in the gallery this morning, that is a uh, sort of a reduced version of the much larger exhibition we had at our museum in the summer. And uh, again, we're thrilled that LexArts had it. Um, I, I think Mr. Morgan ha has some very interesting perspectives as another working artist on, on what Mark's done over the years. And I know they've had a very long relationship even though it, they just met face to face recently. Yeah, that's an uh, interesting part of the story. The first piece I ever saw of Mark's was 26 years ago. I saw a piece that was a little cage that was made out of twigs that had fallen off a tree in the prison yard that Mark had tied together with a string. And in the middle of that little cage was a, a primitive naked man sitting on uh, where Mark had painted some spread out newspaper, very much like you would do to potty train a puppy, and, and, uh, and uh, the piece haunted me. Uh, the, the expression on the, the person's face, and I assumed it was a self-portrait, but uh, for the next 26 years, I saw almost every piece he produced and helped to get his work out of prison and into the viewing public, and uh, I was uh, continually sucked down this vortex of like a uh, mysteries and enigmas and uh, mysteries within mysteries and personal language of prison tattoos and personal language of reinterpreted prison tattoos and keys and keyholes and locks and clocks with hands and clocks without hands and numbers and days and uh, 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 amazing personal mythology and I was like uh, struck that it really resembled monastic art that I had seen, even as a little boy, a little Catholic boy, uh, uh, holy cards of saints and uh, holding uh, implements of their martyrdom in their hands and uh, uh, people uh, exploring the human condition and living in, I thought Mark is living in a monastery in a way, he's in a cell and he is on this journey of personal discovery and using art as like, uh, a tool to perform his own self uh, uh, psychoanalysis to stay sane for 27 years in the prison system and uh, working with paper mache made out of prison toilet paper and at the beginning like a, a very very uh, primitive conditions and tools and uh, so uh, we communicated uh, through uh, he sent art out I got to look at amazing messages from his mind and the depths of his soul and then I would send in a tiny note that would say, can you make a coffin? <laughs> I was, I'd say it was like communicating in haiku almost, you know, and uh, we never met all those years, never talked on the phone all those years. And uh, so, uh, so uh, uh, that is... Uh, a little bit of what I learned in those 26 years. I'm going to give it uh, back to Matt to let Mark talk some here. Well, Mark, uh, you know, having worked with Mark's art for a long time and, and, and Mark 
personally much more recently. Um, one of the questions that's always asked is, while you were in, in prison, how did you come to art making and what drove you forward to, to accomplish what you did? Can you, can you address those things uh, a little? In prison, they had a early on college programs and I took an art appreciation class. And uh, at the end of the semester, we was, the, the teacher asked us to go back to our dorm and make the art out of whatever we could find. And uh, I happened to choose toilet paper and uh, I sculpted a cockatoo and I was amazed that I was able to do that. And then when I took it and showed her, her reaction to it just inspired me more because I, I reacted to it by like, wow, I can do, actually do this. And, and I found something to, I finally found something, you know, that had meaning to me. And, uh, and that's how, I, how it started. Um, you, how many pieces do you think you made during those 26 years you were really I'd active in art? Maybe? Probably around 100. So, and, and almost probably 40% of those are on display out in the gallery. So there, there's a good representation of your work there. Right. Talk a little bit, Mark, about the uh, materials and, and the primitive nature of the tools you had to work with right. and the conditions under which you made art. It started early on, they didn't allow glue in prison, so I had to use, improvise, and I was using like crushed noodles or oatmeal and stuff like that as paste and newspaper. And you know, and it wasn't until I went back to KSP, the maximum security prison, that they allowed you to have glue and it allowed me to get smaller and more detailed. And I used tools like uh, uh, spoons, toenail clippers, needles, a lot of my hands. It's mostly just a water and toilet paper mixture all the way up to the final phase of where you coat it with whatever it is you're going to use to harden it. And uh, uh, I, th I, th I think uh, probably the, the biggest tool I used was like a paintbrush. I would pull the hairs out of it and flatten it out, and it gave me a real nice sculpting tool. That was probably my most important there for the really smaller work. Um, let's look at a few pieces up here. Behind us, I think this first piece you'll see what 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 I'm going to try and do here is sort of give you an idea of how Mark's work developed over time. I think there 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 were a couple stages during his development when he seemed to take great leaps forward. Uh, but but this first piece you see up on the screen that's from the mid 1990s. It's a man in a cage, and which became a common motif. Um, for Mark, but there are also those themes you, you, you can see there, even very early on, that the title of the show was drawn from, Time and Chance. You know, there's the clock, there's the dice. You know, it's all there, e even very early on. And I think this piece is, it's from our collection, but uh, not coincidentally, it's a piece that was donated to us by Mr. Morgan many years ago. Do you guys have anything to say about that one? Do you remember making that one? I, I remember, yeah. I remember all my pieces. This was, this was a really early one. Um, I hadn't, I hadn't been in long enough that the dial, you know, it started, the numbers started changes, and I started, I stopped using actual, you know, one, two, three, on the clock or years, and and that was really on before I started, you know, putting the, uh, the clocks without hands for life sentences and stuff like that. Um, yeah, that was that was a really long time ago. <laughs> Let, let's see that next one. Um, I, I, I think Mark can talk about this yeah. a little. It's obvious what the, what the theme of this is. Talk about um, your, your relationship. This is a piece from the early 2000s, I think 2003 or so. Talk a little yeah, bit about it. This piece right here, uh, I had, we wrecked with death row. They, they have outside recreation with us, and I got to know some guys on there. The backdrop was done by Leif Eckerson. The chair was done by Pat Sanborn, and it was like, you know, the crucifixion and uh, paying for your crime and stuff like that. And uh, they, they actually asked me to do a piece on them and maybe... But that's a, you know, I, I think that this is a piece I saw very early on that, that we acquired at the museum when I saw this one. I went, wow. You know, they're, they're, 
things had really moved ahead over the intervening two or three years since, I, since I'd seen Mark's work previously. Um, go up to the next one. I, I think that here's one, you know, not, not everything Mark made was a, in prison was about prison. I sort of viewed this, this one always as, you know, I, did, I didn't know if you were hoping this would be you one day when you could go fishing with the dog. Yeah, ideally. <laughs> Yeah, um, there there's still crime being committed here. There's some trespassing Somebody's going drinking there because there, 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 there's a no fishing sign. <laughs> I'll mention right here that uh, there's uh, generally uh, thought to be three kinds of art produced in incarceration, and uh, three broad areas of art. Uh, uh, one would be art that has to do with the actual crime. Uh, the second one being art that was about the actual experience of being incarcerated. And then the third category being a flight of fantasy that has nothing to do with any of this. That I'm not here, I'm not in prison, and uh, uh, there's none of the crime or the incarceration experiences involved. And over the years, amazingly, uh, I mean, few incarcerated artists develop fully in any of these categories, but Mark actually uh, intuitively uh, uh, accomplished and did bodies of work in all three of those categories during his incarceration. Um, let's go to the next piece. Uh, this is Buster. Talk a little bit about Buster's a recurring character right. in Mark's work. Talk a little bit about who Buster was. Buster is that guy that's uh, he's sort of like the predator in there. Um, I call him Buster Head, Buster Cherry. Um, he's He's that big guy that preys on the young boys that come in or something like that. Um, it, he's, he's based really on a guy that I met when I first went in there that was, was that had that character about him. He was just a big muscle-bound guy that had no other thing in life but to you know, take things from other people or, and, and stuff like that. He, he was a real-life character. And uh, go to the next one. And we'll see Buster appears again here at the weight <laughs> pile. Um, talk a little bit about um, the and the little guy sitting on sitting on the floor that's got the mop on his head. Talk yeah. talk a little bit about his character and his relationship with Buster and how how the folks in prison reacted when when you took on those themes. What. Well, yeah. This character, you know, it was it was a fun character. I mean, a lot of my friends were in that situation. Um, it's it's not really frowned upon in there or anything. Uh, uh, it's 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 it's. it's uh, I don't know how to say it. It's not. Uh, it is just a part of life in there, I guess, for some people. Um, go up to the next one. I think this is one of the most, at least for me, one of the more interesting uh, pieces. Uh, Mark ever made. This is a self-portrait. The interesting thing about it is that, that the face you see, you know, you see masks. Even the uh, face that the, that, that the prisoner is wearing there is a mask on top of his head. His actual, in, in the sculpture, his, his real face is bowed toward the floor so that you can't see it. Let, talk about those performances that were required yeah. in prison. You really can't be who you are. You always have to wear this hardness on you. And if you see behind this piece is a mask that has a smile and it's and it's locked off. Smiling is sometimes considered a, a show of weakness in there. So regardless of how you feel, you always want to play that tough guy character in there. The, uh, the next one... Um, this piece called Barbed Wire, it's just, it's, it's extraordinary. Um, it, you can go out and look at it in the gallery. Do you have anything you want to say about that? This was one of my uh, pieces that I, when I was really feeling hopeless, uh, like I was never going to get out, uh, confined, caged in. I mean, it was really a dark moment in my life in there. And the... The barbed wire, which is, of course, paper mache barbed wire, it is pulling that cage ever tighter. Uh, the, bar the, 
bars are getting closer and closer. Go up to the next one. Well, I wanted to say something about that last one. Uh, the first thing I asked Mark is how he got the bars in like that, you know, because it's paper mache barbed wire, but you can feel the tension of that pulling in. And, uh, and he was able to work out a, a formula for wetting those wooden dowels and taking his belt and tying around it and pulling it in to let them dry. Of course, everything had to be placed inside the cage before the cage can be the lid. And it, it, very much like working with a ship in a bottle, but uh, uh, amazing technical uh, difficulties with that piece. And that's sort of, you're into the late 2000s now. And in 2011, wasn't it? You came up for parole the first right. time, and your parole was denied. Denied. And let's go up to the next piece. Um, after I think Mark's parole was denied, there for about 18 or 24 month period, the the pieces become at, at first more desperate, and we can see that on the next slide. But this one, you know, it, it's a it's depressed. I mean, you. There was a lot. There, there was a good vein of sort of dark humor running through Mark's work. That goes away for a couple of years, and I think this this piece. There's not a lot of color in it. it it's gray. It's you know. It, it's almost resigned at this point. Do you want to say anything about yeah, that two-year period? That's a name. I felt that was a nameless piece uh, with the uh, tattoos of the bars on the body. Uh, I mean, it, it, it just, I just, at that point, I was feeling like a complete hopelessness. You know, I didn't, I didn't know if I would ever get out. I didn't know, uh, I just, I was lost at that, completely lost at that point. And the next piece is another, another example of sort of that uh, period after right. parole was denied. I think when you were feeling, obviously, a lot of anguish. I mean, right. it's a, Tremendous piece to look at. I think that one, the title of that one is Parole Denied Within. Right. And, uh, you know, just startling, a startling piece, but not easy, not easy to deal with for, 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 for a viewer. And by 2011, I think the, let's move on to the cell block scene. Uh, this is, I, I think, one of Mark's masterpieces. It's a large piece. It's six, six cell blocks or, or six cells all together. There's something going on differently in each cell. Um, there, there's the guard station. This piece is wired. It has working lights and fans and things that work with switches. And I think you had to light that one up because if you wanted to make a, a, a piece like this, whereas most of your cages were typically open, You've got spaces here where ambient light can't get right. in, so you were working. Do you want to talk about that piece? I, I was very fortunate. I went to KSR, and, I, and I, one of the teachers there ran an electronic shop, and he, he actually knew about me, and when I came there, he was like, you know, if you want to do a piece, you can use some of my stuff here, and, and he helped me with this. These are actually people that I knew, and it was kind of like the first time that I put sculptures of people in there that I did know. And I, even even down to the guards sleeping there. I, I knew a guy like that too. <laughs> um, let's go on to the next one. And I think this one, uh, you know, when, when I saw this piece and, and knowing what I knew about Mark's biography, this piece was made 2014. You'd been moved down to West Liberty near us and you were, I view this as a much more hopeful piece. Yes. yes. Uh, you, you know, as, as we, we've talked about the keyholes are almost big enough he can climb out of. Yes. Mark's getting close to his uh, second possible parole date here. And you want to talk about this one a little? I wasn't feeling, uh, I mean, I had hoped that at this point. Uh, you know, I'd done everything the pro board told me to do, uh, and I felt really hopeful. And, and you're right, that, that large keyhole is a, a sign that I felt like I might have a chance this time. Yeah, and, and that's... You know, that's just another extraordinary piece. Um, and the last image I included here was a bird. Did you, was this bird made in prison? Yes. Yep. But you, you've gone on now, now that you're out, you've made a lot of wildlife pieces. Talk, talk a little bit about Some, what you're doing since you got out in 2004. Well, you know, birds, 
like it started out with the cockatoo, it was the first piece I made when I went in, and it was actually one of the last pieces that I made when I got out. And um, I guess people are liking my birds, and I, I, it's been in a few of my commissions. That's what that's what I've been working on, fish, and uh, I just recently done a Donald Trump, and uh, <laughs> and uh, he's in the trunk of my car right now. <laughs> But you know, I hope I hope to continue on with things, <laughs> taking it one day at a time. Um, you know, sort of in conclusion, before we move to questions, and I'll I'll throw it to Bob to see if he has anything he would like to say too. Um, Mark's work is special. There's nothing else like it. It's truly extraordinary. Um, you know, I I can't be sure of this with every artist we work with. Um, but I'm pretty certain that 50 or 100 years from now, people are going to be still looking at Mark Francis's work and taking important things from it. Um, so uh, we're all privileged to see it. We're thankful that, that art gave him a path through and, uh, and, and helped him, helped put him in a much better place today. Um, Bob? Well, I just want to uh, say that very few people survived 27 plus years in the uh, penitentiary system and come out anything like close to normal people. And uh, although Mark went through many bouts of insanity and uh, wild depression and uh, psychological sinkholes, he was able to, through his art, provide his own psychotherapy and come out a reasonably normal person. When I met Mark for the first time after all those years, I had no idea what his voice would sound like, what his personality would be like at all, and I was totally blown away by what I discovered to be a humble, normal, fun-loving person with an amazing wit and, and the most clever insight into the human condition, still even in this room. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.